An introduction to Bitcoin. Now, Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, is on the record as saying, Bitcoin is here to stay. Neil Ferguson, the world famous financial historian, says the best investment opportunity arising from the pandemic will be Bitcoin. The Bank of England says blockchain could transform the entire global financial system. Yet, what we're told is that Bitcoin is used by criminals, it's bad for the environment, it's a Ponzi scheme, and it's not appropriate for everyday investors to play with. In New Zealand in particular, it's rare to see a mainstream financial commentator say anything enthusiastic about the topic. Yet, according to recent research conducted by the Financial Services Council, about 21% of people are investing or have invested in cryptocurrencies, an increase of about 7% since March last year. So, should you be holding Bitcoin? The answer to this is maybe yes or maybe no. It really depends on you. Now, many people who hold any type of digital asset like this potentially have gone against the advice of mainstream financial advice, which is pretty much to stay away from it altogether. So in this video, I'm going to break down the basics of Bitcoin for the benefit of those who know maybe they should get involved, but really don't know anything at all about it. The goal here is to provide a bridge between what you may already know about mainstream investing and the new world of investing in blockchain powered vehicles like Bitcoin. So this won't be a long video, but let's make a start. Towards the tail end of 2008, an individual or more likely a group of individuals created a new money system that idealistically proposed an alternative to the current financial system, which appeared to be crumbling thanks to the global financial crisis of 2008. Now, during this crisis, reserve banks and government eventually intervened, but not without what appears to be a permanent loss of trust in the system, which was supercharged by fears of future inflation. Now, this should sound a little bit familiar. Now, in the notes to this video is the Bitcoin white paper. In that white paper, it describes Bitcoin as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. In it, Satoshi Nakamoto states that the root problem with conventional currency is all the trust that's required to make it work. The central bank must be trusted not to debase the currency, but the history of fiat currencies is full of breaches of that trust. Now, a fiat currency, by the way, like the New Zealand dollar or the US dollar, is simply a currency that's backed by the government, but not a commodity. So what are the features of Bitcoin? Well, it's electronic. It exists in online form only. It's finite. The supply is limited. There can never be more than 21 million. It's trustless. It doesn't require trust in an institution or an individual to transact with it. It's transparent. Everyone can peer into the blockchain to look at your transaction history. And most importantly, it solves the double spending problem. So this last one is interesting. As Bitcoin was born thanks to the simultaneous evolution of this thing called blockchain or distributed ledger technology. What's that? Well, think of it like a spreadsheet on your computer, which is really just a ledger that records data. Now imagine your spreadsheet is now distributed on the internet and available to everyone. Everyone can add to it and see all the changes that others have made to it. The only rule, no edits allowed. It's a simple example I know, but this is kind of how the thing works. There's no single individual company or government who's in charge of it. So blockchain technology is a type of road, if you like, and Bitcoin is a vehicle that can drive on it. Now, what I find interesting is that Bitcoin was meant to be a new digital currency that would eventually replace fiat currencies. Bitcoin hasn't replaced the world's fiat currencies, and it may never actually happen because one of the most important characteristics of any currency is this thing called price stability. While you could use Bitcoin as a medium of exchange and a unit of account, due to the huge changes in price that we've witnessed over time, initially it appears as the strongest use case could be as a store of value, in the medium term at least. So Bitcoin isn't so much a digital currency, rather it's a digital asset. So that's what Bitcoin is and why it was invented. Let's now quickly talk about how it works. So how are Bitcoins created? Here's some quick numbers for you. There's about 18 million Bitcoin in circulation. 4 million have been lost forever and only 21 million Bitcoin can ever exist. The remainder of Bitcoin will get released according to a schedule 
gradually until 2140. Now, back to that 4 million that has been lost forever, this by far should be the most concerning aspect of holding any digital asset. And it's something that I'll cover in another video. So how does it work? When you transact with Bitcoin, the data entered into the blockchain needs to be verified to prevent this thing called the double spend problem or someone attempting to spend it twice. So we need to have verifiers performing this function on the blockchain. In return, these verifiers through a process called mining receive a block reward in the form of newly minted Bitcoin. Now, mining requires huge computational power and it consumes a lot of power. But the higher the price for Bitcoin, the more numerous the miners become. Now, roughly every two weeks, a new block is mined. The first block reward was 50 Bitcoin when this all started, quite a lot by today's standards. But due to this thing called the halving event that happens roughly every four years, that reward gets chopped in half. Now, the reward is only 6.25 Bitcoin for each block. This halving event is seen to be the main catalyst behind the huge leap in price that we started to observe again in 2020. The next halving event should happen in 2024. So what's the point of Bitcoin? Well, while Bitcoin may not replace all fiat currencies, it's proving to have numerous surprises in terms of use cases across a multitude of applications. For example, cross-border remittances are around $700 billion per year. So sending money overseas and receiving it from overseas. Now, if you've ever used Western Union as an example, it can take several days to process and you pay on average around 8% for the privilege. With Bitcoin, it takes 10 minutes on average to send and receive it, often far less. And as there is no intermediary involved, the best part is that the movement of Bitcoin is pretty much free. So anyone with a smartphone and access to the internet can access Bitcoin. Think about that for a second. There's roughly 2 billion people in the world who cannot access financial services. Mainstream banking services will likely never reach these people but internet access will. As a digital asset, the main use case for Bitcoin I see is for some everyday investors to include a small portion of it alongside with their other mainstream investments. It may assist in providing diversification when your other investments don't perform well, there's a possibility Bitcoin could outperform or vice versa. And it may also boost the overall performance of your portfolio given enough time, even with just a small portion of it. A great example of this is with a New Zealand fund manager, who shall remain anonymous, who had on average a five-year growth rate on their KiwiSaver of 133%. How's that for a decent rate of return, right? Now they have just a small amount of their portfolio allocated towards Bitcoin. So that's it for today's video. Let me know if you like that or if you have any further questions, please just include it in the comment section and I'll address it in a future video. But Bitcoin can be a tremendously beneficial addition to your portfolio. Uh, I am going to suggest, though, that it's not for everyone. In later videos, I'll cover off why I think that and how to gain exposure to it if you feel that it's right for you. Have a great week, and we'll catch you next time.